Our children live immersed in a racist discourse which has no equal in what is called the enlightened world, world today. Excuse me. <clears throat> not only towards the Arabs. Racism does not stop at the checkpoint, but it goes on against Arab Jews, against so-called Jewish immigrants the Jewish agency brings from overseas, Ethiopians, everyone against everyone. The election campaign in Israel a few months ago was worth of an election campaign in a fascist state. Our children who live, who reside under the earth remind us that we have not done enough to eradicate racism. We have not done enough against mind infection. We've actually betrayed them because we promised them a better world and a good life. The only way for me to do them justice and maybe gain some peace for ourselves is to try to eradicate racism, bigotry, mind infection and blind loyalties and to raise the voice of mothers. The voice of mothers is the most oppressed, suffocated voice in the history of man. In all our histories and mythologies, always in a moment of crisis, there's a mother who defied the authorities, who deceived the king, the husband or the father in order to save the children. That's why in the Jewish Talmud, they say that mothers are prophets. And the explanation is that they always knew what's best for their children and they did whatever they could to achieve that. And I think this kind of motherhood is today dead or perverted to the point that mothers actually send their children to become soldiers of so-called leaders who have nothing but interest and profit for themselves in their mind and serve them, as I said, as chips in the blood market. The only way we can help our children is to refuse them to cooperate with this. To refuse them for even by forsaking our relationships with them. Many mothers come to me and say, but my son is going to hate me if I don't let him go to the army. And I said, let him hate you for a year or two or five or ten. My own son, my both sons, my eldest sons, served in the army when the tragedy happened and they lost their sister. My eldest son, who was in an elite unit, which was his hard desire and his aspiration to the point that nobody could say anything, not even my father, who served in the army for 40 years and then dedicated himself to peace. My father was the first one to meet our chairman Arafat in Tunis with the help of his Palestinian friend, Isam Satawi, who was murdered for this friendship later on. Before he died, he implored my son, Elik, not to enlist and to go to the university instead. He told him that an army of peace needs educated officers. He didn't live to see the rest of it. And I told my son there, you have to lie to your grandfather because he's going to die. And we want him to die in peace. Nevertheless, he enlisted. And then he realized the futility 
and not only the futility, but he realized, and he keeps saying that now and all the time when he speaks for the new movement, Combatants for Peace, he realized that indirectly he was the cause for his sister's death. His brother was just one month in the army and he believed that by being a good soldier he's going to save the whole world. Now there's a very perverted law in Israel, which is famous for perverted laws, that in a bereaved families, the parents have to sign for the children an agreement if that they allow them to become fighting soldiers. And that means that they confront you with your children in such times. I refused to sign and he was very depressed. And as we are, the family that we are, I got a telephone call from the chief of staff. I was in London at the time and he called me to London and he said, lady, your little games cost us money. We invested in this boy. I told him his little games cost me much more. And then, in order to revenge or to get back at me, they transferred him from the elite unit where he was to a garage. There he met people he would never have met anywhere else. What, what is called in Israel the second Israel. Today, when he speaks, and he does all over Europe, about refusing, because he became refusing after that, he says that my mother taught me to refuse by refusing me. And my days in the garage not only saved my life, but saved my human image. So our duty as mothers, I believe, is really to fight that, to stand in the way of our children and refuse them to cooperate with the forces of evil, namely with the democratic powers of what is called the enlightened world today. I don't know if here you have conscientious object, objection to going and kill Afghanis, uh, Afghan children, but um, I know that people go from here to Afghanistan to do the job, uh, but many people are very afraid of the very idea of refusal. So the point is refusal to what? If we say we refuse evil wherever it is, then this is a good piece of education. We are here, I believe, to remind the world that all the historic processes and all the international discussions which has not, have not yet saved one child from death, neither the European Parliament nor the Vatican nor the UN nor the Nobel Prize Committee who rewards ex-murderers every year instead of rewarding persevering mothers have not saved one child from death. And we are here to remind the world that all these big people and big discussions and big money and big words are finally reduced to the small body of the little girl in her new uniform and her new school bag lying in the dust in Gaza, her little body pierced with as many bullets as protocol allows. And we are to remind the world of the question asked by the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, who also lost her child to a ruthless regime. Why does this streak of blood rip the petal of your cheek? Thank you.